Hello, everybody. Welcome after the coffee break. Hope you're enjoying the coffee or the ice cream, if I can see correctly. So that's exactly my talk of the or tutorial for the session. Like, how can we plug or how can we implement a nicer way to uh, convert your traffic or convert your traffic on your website or something or any kind of product page you have through different kinds of method and with a special focus on reinforcement learning. And as you see, it's more like in the context of search, so how relevancy and search plays there. So before I dig down, since the internet is pretty slow here, so please try to go there. Or if you have managed to come up with the uh, schedule slide, I have put the link there. It's just three files. Just try to download this. Um, so I'm Anab. I'm working for Mobile, uh, which is the car verticals for EV classifieds group since almost two years now as a senior data scientist. Um, I've been in Germany like for eight years almost, and yeah, I was doing my masters from Max Planck, uh, Saarbrücken. Um, yeah, I was a small kid. I mention that because uh, I do a lot of reinforcement learning with him on everyday basis. Uh, I'll give you some examples. So, what's we gonna do today? So, we talk a bit about information retrieval. That's like not getting into the details, like what exactly it is, but more. Why are we doing this session today? How is it relevant? And how can you implement on your day-to-day -day basis? I'll talk about very little about A-B test, but more into bandit methods. Anybody heard of bandit methods before? Cool. That's the perfect audience for me. And I'll show you the variants of different bandit methods, and also we will implement one. If you want, you can go on with me. I have the notebook already pushed to GitHub. All right, it's, it's very simple. It's nothing data heavy. And we'll draw some conclusions, see like where, when to use what. So talking of IR, or like information retrieval. So on an extremely general level, information retrieval is about how you can order a set of documents. You have a particular query, and you want to ask the black box, and he wants to retrieve, uh, or you want to retrieve a set of documents. Uh, that's all it's about. But if you see from the timeline basis, it's a very, very old concept. Like back in the 1960s, this grand idea was came into inception, and from there on, you see how it developed. And initially, it was just text once, and then it was more document-centric. And now it's more into conceptual searches and stuff like that. So if you can, or if you want to have a, like a more familiar names, like what does this text search mean, or document search mean, so maybe these terms would help you. For example, in the text search, it's basically trying to touch every word you have in your documents, like throw away all your uh, like non uh, stop words or punctuations and stuff like that, and just index the ones which are meaningful, like inverted index, Boolean in retrievals. These are like some of the. I wouldn't go into the details for this. Then comes the more structured information. For example, you are more bothered about simulate. You have a query and you want to find out. Uh, what's the most relevant document. So there comes this vector model. So you represent your query as a vector, and in the same vector space, you represent your documents. It's basically a, like, a, like two vectors playing with each other. Like how close they are depends on the angle between them. Simple enough. Or even TF-IDF, uh, term frequency, inverted document frequency. Just just look it up. And in the, in the more recent, it's like more conceptual searches. For example, you can hear of knowledge graphs. You can hear of semantics there. You can hear of ontologies. You can have like graph traversal algorithms there, entity linking and stuff like that. So this is like the more recent stream of research in this direction. So why am I talking of this? The methodologies are different. Like it has evolved over the ages. But what remains still a problem is defining relevance. I come to the site and look for a like a really nice burger place versus your friend who is sitting in. Uh, let's say, I don't know, New York or something, and looking for a burger place, the results are different. Of course, you can just localize it. What's the big deal in it? But take it to a different level. Like, you have a different persona. You have a different way of browsing your internet. You have n number of different factors which makes you, you. So this relevance is personalized. This relevance has a business aspect, and also it has some general aspects. So as I mentioned here, like, which information is relevant for you, and who is deciding that, and how actually would you even, like what are the criteria that say, okay, that's relevant or that's not relevant. 
So there are like different strategies for like coming up with a relevant document. For example, like you can say like, okay, I just want to look into user relevance. If he's going to click on a particular item, that's a very simple way of looking into it. So you will see later, like here, I have to come up with a definition of relevance, and I try to model the problem and optimize it against that. And that's why I spend some time on this slide, um, so that you understand, like, what exactly or where can I fit this reinforcement strategy of uh, your making a making a web page work or like making your search results more relevant. So what I'm trying to propose here is not just go for like. Okay, that's the approach, bam. I'm not gonna uh, change it. That's my criteria for uh, relevance, which could be like a, a click, click rate or it could be like something more business specific. And I'm not gonna change my path, so that's gonna fix. Or would you prefer something like a strategy which you are able to modify, which, which you're able to adapt depending on your needs? Or what I mean is more dynamic way of tackling this relevance problem. So that completely brings me to this um, stage where I can discuss exactly about the bandits problem. So what are this class of bandits problems? So here I'm taking a bit of detour from my like the, the classical IR definitions and trying to give you an introduction. So what I'm planning to do in this whole session is I give this mini intros into these concepts we see and we, tr we dig a bit into one of the algorithms and we try to implement that. So otherwise I can just jump into the Python notebook code and then, I mean, you, you don't take anything away with you. So just try to be, so take it relaxed so you don't have to have a lot of coding and stuff like that. So um, a bandit problem is basically how you can deal with some kind of dynamic systems. Like if you have some variations going on, it's if you have something, for example, a classical is your web page. You have results, you have people logging in from different parts of the world, they have different interests, and the end goal is pretty obvious. Like you want your visiting people, the users to, to end up with your, uh, to the end of the, say like conversion funnel, or however you want to say, you want them to stay on your page, buy an article, and move on. So that remains kind of the same. But how can you adapt to this kind of uh, dynamic system? So that's basically the whole gamut of bandit problems, how you deal with those. And adding to that, bandit problems, they really do not know about what's going on. So they just see, come, react, and then just adapt. So that's the cool thing about it. You really don't have to throw in like a, sh like a, like a loads of, uh, um, uh, prior knowledge, well, take it with a pinch of salt. For example, there would be like Bayesian bandits as well, where you have, you can throw in like uh, priors to it. And this is like a classical reinforcement learning. So this is like exactly when I was mentioning of my kids. So he's like two and a half years old and he's into puzzles. Like each time he puts a block, he looks at my face and I have to clap, say, so Papa, clap. So that means he did it right and he just moves on with it. If he's, I don't do that, so it's kind of a rewarding or some kind of, that's a classical example of a reinforcement. You have to tell the system, like, hey, you did a good job, go ahead. Or if you say, like, no, oops, it's a wrong one, so it's, oh, sorry, I did something wrong, let's me rectify in the next step. So that's the whole concept of reinforcement stuff. Sounds familiar. Okay, then how is this A-B testing? Like, everybody does A-B testing in, in, in on our, like, day-to-day -day basis, probably. We throw everything to A-B testing. So the basic difference probably lies in the like the last point which I mentioned, yeah, with me I should have put it in the first. So it's like how this kind of methodologies deal with the exploit and explore dilemma. What does it mean? So exploitation phase is basically trying to, or like explore and exploit. So like trying to find the ways you can optimize. Once you find that way, exploiting is sticking to it, sticking to that and trying to exploit it as much as you can. Like, hey, that's a good guy. Like get the juice out of him. That's the exploit. Uh, concept. So the way A-B testing differs from reinforcement is basically how they are dealt with. That could be very nicely um, visualized in the diagram below. So on the x-axis you have basically the weeks uh, as long as we, your, your test is running basically. So week one to week six. Let's say it's an ABC kind of test. Okay, so what you see is A, B, and C. All these variants are online simultaneously. Good, but the bad is on the y-axis is basically traffic to the site. It's kind of divided one-third to each of the sections. 
Then after the end of five weeks, you find a very nice statistical uh, significance uh, number. Uh, some test is done, optimizely gives you an awesome report. So yeah, option A is the way to go. So you stick to it. What happened? Till one to five, you lost a lot of traffic. Like you lost all the traffic to B and C. Yes, you have an awesome statistically significant number, but your, your website didn't make money for five weeks. Look into the side, I mean, the, the bandit selection way. So it starts with three different kinds of algorithms denoted by the same options, different colors. What you see is the best one, apparently, like the option A. It starts to get better and better, and you see it has a greater share, or like it's trying to, can you see the mouse? Okay. It's trying to get more and more customers to convert to your site over the weeks. And you see within almost like Third week onwards, it's kind of predominantly ruling your site. So that's awesome. Okay, so just to keep some points in your, uh, just on the back of your mind, so for example, short period of exploration, as I mentioned with uh, exploration and exploit dilemma. So A-B testing has extremely short period of uh, explorations because they are not really exploring all the options like together, so like one have um, like, um, like you, you look into like all the three, like very short time, but you exploit for a long time. Once you have it, okay, option A is the way to go. Cool. So why to use Bandit's algorithm? Look into the right side. That's actually a, just, just type this in Google. So the reporter who put this, it, it's an article from New York Post. I think you can see from the quality of the newspaper, it's a, uh, there was some gang war and somebody got killed, anyways. so. The editor of the paper was having a dilemma into put like which title to put so that he has the maximum number of people buying his newspaper. So this was the one, and the second one was like a murder victim in an adult um, entertainment club or something like that. And this has nothing to do with reinforcement learning, but this has always been used as a classical example where you try to uh, validate your point. Like if you want to have your customers converge to your site faster or like way efficiently. So you always have to go for more like a bandit's way. Like you have to give them an option to choose or like the, let's say a website, it has to have an agent or it has to have a, like, a, like a determining body which can say like, okay, now I display this kind of titles more. Think of it like for your products page. Could be like, like your new iPhone, how should the title look like or I don't know, any kind of product. So carrying on with it even more. So there are some like obvious I would just want to like summarize. So the good thing about this is you can learn about your data set, you can learn about your traffic as you're going through the test, so which is really cool. You can really automate, that's, I really love that uh, very nicely because the moment you see like something is not working really good or you can see like, okay, if I can tweak something, you can really automate that machine learning part as the thing is gone, is live. So you can have like a feedback loop, I can show you um, like a prototype architecture diagram, how you can incorporate that in your like a live system. And um, it's also like a good one in trying to eliminate the good versus the bad or even the ugly ones. So basically, it explores everything and it just gradually filters out the, the bad guys out, like the low performing candidates. So that's overall extremely helpful. So now I talk a bit details about what are the bandit algorithms. So usually like there are like the three major ones. So epsilon greedy, uh, upper confidence bound, and this Thomson sampling, which is, we are gonna talk here a bit more details about the epsilon greedy process. It's extremely simple, it's very easy to understand. And the other ones are a bit more sophisticated under the sense um, that it has a bit of uh, Bayesian statistics playing. Um, for example, the Thomson sampling, it's been classical like a Bayesian uh, bandit uh, strategy. Uh, just to go through it, what is this epsilon uh, greedy? So it's, it has two components. One is the epsilon part, where it's trying to explore, and a greedy part, which is the exploiting part. Like in computer science, greedy is always a kind of algorithm which is, I say it lazy, I mean like, it doesn't really like to try out stuff. It just sticks to what it has, and it tries to like, Exploit, that's the term, like exploit it as much as possible. And there is a component called epsilon. I'll just go, like show you like what is this epsilon component and what it is doing. This upper confidence bound or the UCP one, so this is a very 
like it really works very well. Like I'm not uh, ordering this by the level of performance or something. I'm just mentioning them like randomly. So this one, this uh, UCB algorithm is more like an optimistic one. So it has a very good notion about the world, and it's a very like a nice way to see. Like it's also coming from a, like a person, like how you see it. So you see, you have a very good notion of the world, and the moment you get penalized, your notion about the world breaks. I was like, oh. Oops, that was not so nice. So it goes back and tries to like rectify itself. And with the Thompson one, it's like classical Bayesian. So you start with the prior. So that's that's what I said when I said like you don't really need a, like a extremely wide knowledge about your setup, but it's more like you can set some kind of prior knowledge, which could be like an absolutely average. You can have start with a uniform distribution, like just a straight line. That's the prior. Doesn't harm. I mean, like you can read like the other papers where. They have played around with different priors. That's a different thing. But uh, but as you update, as you see more evidences, it goes on updating its posterior, it's classical Bayesian. So epsilon greedy algorithm. So I take some time here because um, I'd really like to uh, that you understand it because you would exactly see some parts. Like I'll show you lines in the code which exactly does this part. So um, that's how it works. So you start with a, from your state, let's say, like, let's say just a state uh, from your web page or like your search results page. With the epsilon part, it's gonna explore it. Okay, so it's this could be like usually zero to ten percent, twenty percent, and with the other rest, so it's kind of sticking to it. So that's the greedy part of it. So it says, okay, eighty percent time, I'll choose my best arm. Let's let's forget about the arm for the moment. Let's just say the best performing algorithm, and the rest, let's say twenty percent or fifteen percent, I, I try out other stuff. So that's what I uh, now try to connect the dots, like what I just mentioned a few slides back. Like it tries to eliminate the good and the bad. So it's sticking to a good one, but also giving it a chance to explore the bad performing ones. Who knows? Maybe there is a good one who is really doing good in some region or something like that. And once you have like a like a testable candidate, you can just have like as many possible possibilities there. For example, you can choose one of the different possibilities in that exploratory part, and you go on updating yourself. So just as a, it's very ob, it's very obvious. For example, if you have epsilon zero, that means you're not at all exploring. So you're extremely greedy. You stick to what you have. Okay. And if you have an epsilon of one, that means it would really be super exploratory. It's not gonna stick to what you have found out. So I'll show you like how the results vary. Dramatically they vary. So, so, so far so good. So you, you saw about like a bit of IR. So you saw like different ways of uh, having a relevance. You also had a bit of intro into the like epsilon greedy algorithm. So how can this come together in the context of search? So this is a kind of a proposed architecture, let's say. So on the left you have like, this is really very top level, like Elasticsearch uh, cluster or something where you have your items, documents, ads, whatever indexed. You have a query coming in. What you can have is different kinds of algorithm, which I say here like algorithm two, like this one, let's say algorithm one, three, four. So basically there are four possibilities of showing your page or ranking your page. That's what you see here. So like you have, a, let's say, a particular timestamp, a particular algorithm, and S1 means a search result page. Um, so you, what it means, like at that particular timestamp, that algorithm produced that particular search page, and so on and so forth. And that is shown to the user, let's say. Now the user behaves in some way with this, with this search result page. Once you have that kind of uh, explicit uh, contact point, the user likes or dislikes, or could it be some other problem? Could it be like, a, it doesn't have to be a user. It, it could also be like, let's say, your, your admin or your, somebody else who is even like a seller, so who is actually selling items. Like I always talk of this because we are from eBay, whatever. Um, they give some kind of feedback and that feedback can be incorporated and that's where this dynamic optimization which I was talking of in the few slides back. So here you can really adapt and see, okay, the moment you see T3 is performing really nice, you can boost up something or you can just incorporate that um, info point into your feedback loop and that can improve stuff. 
So now comes multi-arm bandage. So this is like the classical diagram you always see. So why it's called multi-arm? Because a bandit, or like who has a who has a certain probability of choosing something, yes or no, let's say, the moment scale this up. For example, when you have many bandits like that, so basically like a lot of algorithms which I just mentioned. So those are basically like different bandits. So each one of them has a bit of probability of their success. So that's what the multi-arm concept comes in. So I'm coming from a very top-down approach. So I didn't want to present the multi-arm just before I want to give you like the global picture. Okay, you have four or five algorithms. They just relate to like your four or five bandits. They're like they're together having some probability of returning a success value. Um, as I said, so success value or we all, like in, in these terms we always say it's like a reward function or something like that. Very simple, let's say one or zero, you can have something else as well. And the overall idea is, let's say, like how it works, so you have these four or five, six machines, you go to this casino, you pull a lever, you get some coins. What do you do next? So that's exactly the setup, so you, 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 you display your website, you display your search results from the output from a one algorithm, which algorithm should you show next? So that's exactly where this epsilon greedy and multi arms is coming into the play. So you say, well, I am 80% greedy, 20% exploratory. So you, 20% of the time, you look for other arms as well. You pull them as well. You see like, okay, you pull it, you also get a bit more value. Or it could also happen like you get way lesser coins. So you fall back to your previous best. And you keep on doing this for many, many number of times. So that whole, point of this game or the task is in what order, in how would you pull this arm so that you can maximize your the coins you earn from these uh, machines. So to, to put it in our context, so it's like how can you display the search results page using different kinds of algorithm or different kinds of relevance algorithms so that your maximum convergence is achieved. That's, that's exactly the problem statement. And you see like how easily with a very simple um, epsilon greedy stuff you can uh, achieve that. So I think, uh, okay, so this is just to like give you a clear, like so the band is here in our context is basically the each algorithm and the agent is one who is taking this decision for you, one who is doing this automated game playing for you. And uh, so this epsilon is basically, I'm already repeating myself already now, so epsilon is trying to, it's a hybrid of it. You explore a bit and uh, exploit a bit. So it's, it's, it's a mixture of these two approaches. Now, a bit of math, I mean like super simplified math. Uh, this is interesting, I mean, nothing to worry. So. What we define is basically a action value function. So which means, which is defined by this Q. So it means like, what is your expected long-term award for choosing, uh, like a, for taking an action A from state A. So you're in a particular state, which is like, let's say your website comes live, and you choose an action, which is like choosing algorithm one, like one, 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 three, two, two, one, three, two, two, four. So these are your discrete actions. What is the expected gain by using a certain set of actions? So that's exactly defined by this. Um, so let's say for one particular algorithm, so the expected, um, or let's say like the end of this whole reverse, so as you can see, like there are like number of times you're displaying a search results page because a lot of users are coming in. So each time you're displaying something, it's basically like a, like a state you can say, and we can, sh I'll show you later, like this, this can be repeated multiple number of times. So for one particular bandit or one particular algorithm, the expected long-term gain is very simplified, like there is no integral, no differentiation, it's just plus minus, probably class. Look into the first line for the moment. Like for k steps, for like k was make how many times a was chosen, let's say algorithm one, how many times did you choose it? Let's say 10 times. And each one of those 10 times, what were the rewards? Yes, 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 zero, zero, one, zero, something like that. Let's say the reward is just one and zero. So, so that's basically your expected, very simple, just add it up. Like uh, each time you pull the lever or each time you show the page, just add it up. Simple, just replace k by k plus one. So like what, what it becomes? 
nothing fancy like everybody cannot get this just replace k by k plus 1 now from this is like three three lines of just writing it on your paper from this uh, q k plus 1 state you can just find like so this becomes like a more like a recursive definition of it so to find a particular state you just need to go to your previous step and award for like the reward for that step and just subtract your previous state so it's basically a, a cumulative reward or cumulative uh, action which is happening here. Now what? So if you have a state or if you have a state function like that, who is your best algorithm? Simple, just where A is maximum. Like you have one, two, three, four algorithms, do this, do this computation for four algorithms and just find out who gives you the maximum Q, as simple as that. And that's your basically the greedy part of it. And I can show you like um, in, a, in a short file, so like that would give you the like the like the greedy part of it. So the epsilon part is still, I didn't touch it here, so epsilon part is still like the, just say it's a random part. So you can choose any one of it. Okay, so enough of it. Let's try to pull up the notebook. If you want, you can, did you manage to get the, uh, yeah. So I would just, propose uh, you be with me, you will go through very uh, slowly with the code, you can try it yourself, there are very small places where you can change and see the differences. Um, just a couple of words, I prefer to use virtual environment using Conda, something like that, PEEP is also fine, um, just that I personally like Conda better, and just activate that environment and try to install these dependencies. Like IPyKernel would be really helpful because uh, in that case you can have your environment within your notebook. And Seaborn Pandas is pretty standard because I, I, I just love to draw something. Okay. And I don't see it. Okay. So, going through it very slowly. Um, pretty standard. I mean, like nothing fancy here. Uh, yeah, I mean, just standard pandas for some data manipulation. Like, there is no external data sources. I just created some, like, uh, mock data, data structures, data sources from here. Um, so, when we are talking of this SRP or like the search results page or cellular relevance uh, in context of um, search, so what we need to do is look into this later. So I just created four different search results page. Okay, very simple. It has an ID column, it is a click probability column, and a dealer column. What I mentioned before, like what is your target or what is that business need or the user need you are really optimizing for? What is that you want to be rewarded for and what is that you don't want to be rewarded for? That's where actually the dealer comes. So dealer is basically when we are um, selling an item, we want to have a bit of, um, let's say, preference or like a bit of boost for the, so those guys who are like premium account holders. Okay, and like those who are not premium account holders, they have to be dealt with differently. So it's basically just a one and zero. As you can see, it's like, creating like a one and zero for randomly on this uh, on this third column. And I define a max results list length, which is basically I think 500, yeah. So, so basically a search result page, which is having 500 uh, results, let's say, simple as that. And it has an ID, which is basically just uh, like a serial like ID, let's say, range from one to the maximum length, one to 500. This is the interesting part. So what it does is, this is something which you're gonna touch if you really want to have this in production because this is the probability which is gonna change. Let's say you, you have a page, you have some assumed probability of clicking that item and let's say you find that, oh, that item is more clickable, you put this in this feedback loop. So that's the item that's gonna change. So keep that in mind. So that's the, the trick part or let's say that's the uh, essential part. What I've done here is basically for that column, or like generate a click probability, so it's like, I can just show you maybe. Yeah, something like this. It's just, I just pull up a particular search result page which has got a, some IDs. 
and every every um, ID has a click probability of this. And, and we say like if it's coming from a dealer, yes, yes, no, and so on and so forth. Now, but you can see that's only this part of the code. Like I just have four um, search results by different by four different um, click probabilities. What you can see here is basically the change happens only here. The rest of the part is same. So this means this would always try to return a value between 0.3 and 1. Whereas this one, this one would try to give you like a value from 0 to 1. And this is like a different one, like one, 0, 1 to 6. So what I'm doing is I'm kind of forcing the different search results space to generate different types of click probability. One intentionally a bit higher, so that means those items produced by that page are just more clickable, let's say that way. How it, uh, okay, and what I do here is basically get this data frame, get this pandas data frame, and simply try to find out, like if it's a dealer, so that's exactly the, the thing which is up to you. What does showing that page mean to you? Where here I have defined like, okay, if I show that kind of a page, the return on the score from that page is something like how, how clickable it is, in which rank it occurs. So that's why you have divided by the ID. So further you go down the rank. So guy, let's say, so the first one, how it's computed is basically this value divided by one into one. Whereas if you go this guy, it's like this divided by two because even if it's a higher probability, the fact that it's operating at rank two, you just smoothen it or you just decay it. Let's say not smoothen, decay it. You can have different decay functions. You can have like exponential decay and stuff like that. It's very simple. Like I just want to have like from this page, like what is the value generated by that uh, in terms of click. And you multiply with dealer because anybody who is not a dealer zero, I just multiply this this column, so it gives no value. So that's very simple. If I, I'll just work with you, so you take the click probability product with the dealer. So whenever it's a zero, the whole sum is basically it has like a zero contribution. Divide by the rank, so it just decays it, and you divide by the sum of the dealer. So if I just want to normalize by the number of dealers, that web page is having, why a plus one? If it doesn't have a dealer, I don't want to have a divided by zero, simple as that. You get a score, return that. So you get like a score generated by rank and, and you repeat that for like 200 times. So basically you create a lot of SRP counts. So basically um, like I'm generating a lot of web pages, a lot of such results page. And so what's interesting is once you generate that, you can try to see like what is the, so this was like the, the part where I mentioned like I made some, some probabilities a bit higher and that's what you see exactly here, wait a second. Just to give you overall picture, so like on the x-axis you have the algorithmic choices and on the left you have the values. So you see the algorithm one, which is on purpose I made it like to have more clickable items. So it's ranked higher, like it's like the distribution of the whole thing. Median value is kind of there, three is way lower. So we're gonna throw in this, this kind of algorithm or just recollect bandits to an agent and the agent would try to find out who is the best. That's, that's the whole uh, goal of this exercise. Um, and, and if you just try to go by the different SRP, so you saw like I'm, I'm generating a lot of pages such like that, so each time I say like, okay, give me four pages from different algorithms. I do it 200 times and you just plot that. So you see this, this uh, blue curve like from the algorithm one, it's more like having like, often you see it's kind of ranked a bit higher, so it's having more value in general. That's how I uh, mocked that data set. Okay, now, now what I do is for each algorithm I try to find like a like a mean value of it, which is exactly what you show uh, what I what I showed in, in in this step. So I just get like okay on an average or the median value for this has this kind of a return. So I just take it and it's just like a very small cute data frame which is having these four values. Okay, um, why I need that? because I need to initialize my bandits with some initial probability. So 
one thing which I really missed, sorry for that, is like whenever you pull an arm, you actually have like a probability or like a, say like, okay, this has this much chance of giving you something. Okay, so that's the knowledge you actually have. So here what I do is just initiate like a set of bandit probabilities with just four values, which is take this value, like the medium value, and just normalize it. So what you get is something like this. So as you see, the algorithm one has like 35.8% uh, chance of, um, let's say, success or, or being having more clicks and so on and so forth. And, and the order is exactly the same as you saw here, like this kind of a U thingy. Okay. What I define more, I like the number of bandits, simple. There are four in this case, I just say like, the length or you can just find it from the other size of the data frame as well, anything works. So episodes and experiments. So the episode is basically the times you play it out. So this kind of algorithm, so it's not like you do like one time you pull the lever, okay, wow, I have everything, I know everything about these four uh, arms or the four algorithms. So you have to keep doing it and it emerges in a, in a certain uh, number of playouts. So we often call it like episodes or playouts, so like the number of times you basically display that page to an end user. Experiment, you do the same exercise this many number of times. So it's not like you run this whole simulation once, but probably like quite a number of times because this just to average out and see like how it um, really pays off like uh, over a large number of draws. So that's always like a case with this kind of random trials as you might recollect from your statistics class like it, uh, it gives you a better sense of uh, the distribution. Uh, this is like some fancy stuff, which you can, I just wanted to, if you want to save a figure or something like that, just skip it for the moment. Okay, here comes the interesting part. So, two components, bandit and agents, right. So, this is just a very small class, which is just a bandit, which I say like, how many bandits are there, and what are their probabilities. That's, uh, I just in initiate that in this constructor, and, Let's go line by line with this one. So get reward. So given a bandit, I say like I take an action. What is my reward? So it's very simple. I just have a like a random reward generated. So which is like a zero to one. And just look into this line. It's like if if the probability for that action. So when when I say action here, so that means like. For this bandit, it's asking this uh, class to say like, okay, what is the reward if I choose algorithm three? What is the reward if I uh, choose algorithm four? So action is basically imagine like one of the four algorithms which I just showed you. Once you have that, it's very simple. Just check the random value. If it's less than zero, less than that, you just set it to uh, one or else it's zero. So we say like, okay, um, so to say it in other words, like there is a number and then you say, okay, should I, should I choose number three? And he says, okay, no, uh, the, the random uh, value is quite low, so you don't choose it, go ahead. This could be modified, it could be more complicated, it's just to give an impression, just to throw like, throw a reward, like yes, no for the next choice, that's it. This, this really doesn't make a difference, like a huge difference, but you can really make it more complicated because you might wonder like, okay, it's a random value, so uh, what's going on here? But not to worry here, it's just giving a reward sense to the next step, that's it. Now is the agent. So agent is basically the guy who is orchestrating the whole thing, okay. Again, it's, I have written it here. So this is exactly the formula you show uh, here, that's why that's why I took this time to write this formula. So it's basically, just update yourself with the same. It's, it's very similar to like we have a lot of gradient descent discussions, and in the morning it's very similar to that. You just take the n minus one state and you just update your n state with it. So simultaneous uh, gradient uh, descent algorithm works exactly like that. Um, here, so you just um define an epsilon, so we are implementing an epsilon greedy algorithm here, so we have an epsilon value here, and some k and q, so basically this q is the thing which we're gonna update. Let's go here, and that's the line, that's it. So you just take an action, you just update your counter, so like this is the k plus one, you make it k plus one, and that's it. I mean you add to your, like the next value is like the previous one, plus equals to is like this, equals to this, so it's like similar to writing like x equals to 
x plus equals to 1. So this means is equals to x equals to x plus 1. So that's the way it is. So that's this operator is doing basically. You try to update your next state with your previous value. And also you have the reward. So you see like updating that particular action with that reward. You, I'll show you like how this reward is coming from where and how this action is um, being pushed here. And now you have everything and you just need to like do the explore part of it. So that's basically like choosing action using an epsilon greedy agent. So you choose a random value and you just say like, okay, is my um, epsilon value like less than that? So if I choose a very less epsilon value, it would try to uh, not explore so much, but it would just go to the greedy approach. But if it's like a decent value, it tries to get into this loop. You can also override it, where you can say by setting it to true, saying like, okay, you always explore. Um, so that's actually the exploratory part, where, where you can imagine like here, nothing fancy. You have like 10% chance, you just pick any, just pick any algorithm, that's it. The interesting part is basically here. So this part is exactly this part. So you, out of all your updates, all your queue actions, you just take the index, or so index is basically from, for four algorithms, you have zero, one, two, three. You take that index, which is giving you the maximum um, reward. That's exactly what you do, and that's like the fancy way of doing this. So you just take the greedy action. So you tell like, okay, that's my guy, that's the algorithm who, whom I should choose next. So this is like the greedy part of it. You have everything now. You have all the things in place. Now we define a experiment. So this is just like like bringing the three, four stuffs together. You initiate like a I can maybe just go here. So there's a simulation step, so maybe that starts from here. So you, I defined you, I showed you the bandit, bandit probabilities, which is like from the mean value, medium values I just computed. I initiate a bandit, and I initiate an agent. I pass that bandit, and I pass an epsilon, as simple as that. Now let's go back, and uh, so you already saw this bandit and agent. Now I take that bandit and that agent, and I say like, okay, let's experiment now. So this experiment basically takes like these two components and let's see what happens here exactly. So given an agent and some bandits, how does the playouts occur across each episode? So like each time you're showing the page, what is it actually choosing? What, what, which algorithm is actually it's playing out? Step one, you have an agent. They say, okay, just choose, an, choose, choose for me something, choose an action. Here's my example. If you just want to recollect what this choose action was, um, is this, this part, which I just explained. So you, with a certain epsilon, either you go the greedy way or the epsilon way. If there is no current best, it just selects something maximum, probably the first one, it doesn't matter. I have an action, now what to do next? What is my reward? It's very logical, see, it like this is just three step. Okay, I got an action, what is my reward? So you go to the bandit and ask, okay, well, give me my reward. So again, this, this, this one which I mentioned, like for choosing that action, if I have it, Give me a one, yes, good, did good job, otherwise a zero. Well, I have my reward. Okay, now I need to update my queue status. So for that uh, action, what is my um, reward I got like cumulatively? And you go on adding that and you just put it into these two variables. So what was the, the set of algorithms chosen in sequence and what was the uh, exact rewards I had? And you just return that value. And if you see here, yeah, that's it. Uh, this is just like to print out something to see like the progress to the experiment. So what I'm doing here is uh, doing this, uh, repeating this play out step quite a number of times. So I just want, don't want to like have like value of like a one here, or like playing it just one on, once, but like do it several times to see that it's really like the best algorithm is the winner. Mm. Okay, this is just some like adding and subtracting and uh, finding the mean and putting it in a list. Uh, this is not the interesting part and I just want to have an average value. So, okay, let's, let's run this. So, okay.
Let's try it now. So what I'm doing here is, let's do the one easier way. So I just want to change my epsilon from like five. What does it mean? Like I am not at all exploratory, which is means epsilon of zero to like 0.5, meaning I'm like I'm gonna explore 50 percent of the time, and then I'll just change it and show you like from if I would really make the epsilon very high, meaning like I'm very exploratory, the results how would they vary, and I run this. So it says like, okay, it's like four band-aids with epsilon of zero. So some words here, so epsilon of zero, what does it mean? Just go back here, just very, very, where is it? Epsilon of zero. You always take the best term. I'm super lazy, or let's say I'm extremely greedy. I found one good one, I'm not gonna ch look anywhere else. I'm gonna stick to that. And that's exactly what's happening. After a few playouts on the x-axis, you see like SRP playouts, which means like search results page, how they are displayed. After a few displays, oh well, algorithm one is super good. I'm never gonna explore anything else. It just sticks to it forever. That's epsilon zero. Now comes with a point one exploration, which means like, 10%. So I'm sticking with the good, but I'm also giving myself or the agent is giving a chance, given a chance to, to explore other opportunities as well. Now you see some, some nice things happening. So you see like the good ones emerging and the bad ones are like the inferior ones kind of um, filtering out. That's exactly what I meant by uh, worse versus the good ones. I go on increasing the epsilon. You can see in the title of the image. So the difference you have to observe in this initial phases, like where the, how sooner it kind of finds that page. So here you see like 10 to the power one, so like approximately 10 pages. Here I guess it's a bit sooner and things like that. Uh, here it has a bit of confusion. It's, it's around like less than 10 pages, 10 playouts, you have some numbers. And I think it's over, yeah. So it's still 0.4. Now I'm gonna change this, change the epsilon values to, to let's say. Yes. Yes, exactly. Just one, yeah. But let's say exactly like that's the whole point. Like if you don't want to like play just once, like you have to run it like several times. Like this is not yet in production, so probably there has to be like a better way of doing it. Of course, like I cannot afford to have like multiple simulations before I sh show a page. So could be like I can do some offline uh, stuff to, from our like historical search results page to see like, okay, what made sense and then stick with uh, some particular epsilon value. So it could be pre-trained in that sense. I mean, as you're right, I mean like just showing it once, you would just stick to one and just play it out that way. Okay, and what I wanted to show was, okay, I wanted to change, let's say, make it really high. So that means, like, very exploratory. Okay. 
here it still kind of makes sense, but you see like, like as we increase this exploratory aspect of it, it starts getting like lesser and lesser evident. I mean, because now you're kind of really picking anything at random at any point of time. So you're not sticking to any greedy approach. And you see like the difference gets smaller and smaller. Like after some point of time, you're, it's just like a coin toss. It's just or like say four, four, four sided dice roll as good as that. So, yeah, that was the main part of it. I mean, this was, this was like, a, like a side um, exploratory task for me, like when I was working at this place too, because we had some um, undergoing discussions about how to display, how to make optimal search and relevant stuff like, so I tried to like have a, like a weekend project on this to see like how does it make sense. But yes, there are like really open points and if you're really working into this search area, like I'd be more than happy to discuss this with you. Like exactly as he asked, like uh, in, in practice, like how would this be optimally designed? Like how can you really play out the most efficient way in the quickest milliseconds possible? Um, these are like some add-on uh, code which would just try to see like, okay, the fact that I choose algorithm one as the winner, so what would be my like eventual play out? So what is my overall gain I'm getting? So you can go through the code, you can just uh, run this. It would just say like, okay, the fact that I'm playing out so many times and sticking to an algorithm one which emerges as the winner. So you can expect like a, like a jump in the SRP score. So this is a SRP score is that, that find two lines of code which I showed in the beginning, like defining the, the return from showing that SRP page. So that kind of rises and it sticks to it. So because you're now playing out that more often, you're sticking to that uh, choice. And um, exactly, and that kind of, well, I have some more. Mm, okay. So yeah, now this is an alternative approach because when I started with the uh, discussion or the, this presentation, I said, okay, there is no just uh, unique way of doing it. Uh, so this is just like a different strategy of solving this problem. Just want to propose that idea here. So when to choose what, like because I know most of you are like very familiar with A-B test and stuff like that. So to, to wrap up, you just carry home with yourself this, this simple message, which is if you really want to have strong statistical reasoning behind your choice, if you really want to have like concrete evidence, like okay, I chose a red button over a blue button because A-B test is the way to go, because that's not really the job of I wouldn't say it's not the job of, but it just takes too long. Because if you say here on the right hand side, to have like enough evidence, for example, I can, I can rephrase this part. So let's say you have multiple variants and you just, I showed you like algorithm four is bad. Yeah, okay, take it with a pinch of salt in the sense, we didn't really explore for a long, long period of time to have an evidence in the sense like four is really, really bad. That's what A-B test would do because you just try and collect evidences, events, clicks, whatever, from different variants, and they would compute this statistical significance from those um, behavior. However, if you really want to have faster convergence, you don't really care if it's good, bad, or ugly, you really want to have people just converge, because that, that's a newspaper. The editor wanted his papers to be sold the next day morning. You don't have time for a bit test. You want you have a new BMW or a new Christmas item on the site, you want people to buy it because the dealer has really is a high high profile dealer. You don't have time for a bit test. Like when you just play it out, they would converge. You can try out different algorithms there, like okay, and suit your needs or suit your prob like problem or like the, the target question in, in such a fashion, uh, it helps. So, Yeah, that's what I exactly meant. Like, think of your use case, where it fits you. If it's there as a possible, keep that graph in mind. Of course, like, is Google doing it this way? Is uh, Yahoo, or Yandex doing it this way? Maybe, may not be, I don't know. They have different, like, they are known for their thing. They are, like, learning to rank models. You can you can challenge, like, okay, they are definitely, like, awesome rank learning to rank models where you can throw in, like, n number of variables. You can just train your query and document as a 
as a joint feature variable, and then you can predict something true, probably. But often, sometimes you can have scenarios where it's just not possible. You might not have all the aspects of the data. You just have few ranking functions to play around with. You have few alternatives to play around with. And you really don't know which works best in which case. So probably give it a thought. It could be a good option. Um, yeah, that's more or less. I finished quite before. I mean, quite preemptively. Like, I still have 30 minutes. Like the epsilon greedy? Yeah. Like or, or generally reinforcement learning because if I use a, a Bayesian method, it would generally also not necessarily need as much time for samples as if I do classic. But you need evidences, right? Um, to update your posterior you need more and more evidences. The better you get. Well yeah, but the same thing is here. As soon as it's standardized, it takes a while. Yes. It's exactly when there is no like theoretically there well, not theoretically, let's say the things they're doing are not really extremely different. Like epsilon is, has a, like, I, I stick to it, I'm exploring, but with the Bayesian approach, it's like updating as it sees. Yeah. Exactly, you can do it. So and that's the, when I was on that slide, I said epsilon grid actually, the Thomson sampling works really good, really, really good. Just for the sake of the ease and like, just to get this concept across, epsilon grid is just very easy to show and stuff like that. I'm pretty sure you can find uh, some implementation there. For this, for the bandit, I guess uh, there is not such library, but for reinforcement learning, there are like TensorFlow libraries and stuff like that you can look into. It. Um, yeah, just for the sake of completion, we are hiring people. We have our booth. Please come over and say us a hello. And we have multiple job openings. And yeah, great for thanks for being a great audience. <laughs>